There is a southern colloquialism that even me being one from the south, I didn't know was a southern colloquialism. I actually learned it recently, and that is break bad. Now, many of you are probably automatically thinking about the television show. We'll talk about that in a second. But to break bad, according to the Urban Dictionary, means to reject social norms for one's own gain or amusement, to give up on the typical moral and social norm, and to go one's own path regardless of the legality or the ethics. And again, there's, there was this show that came out, I think it was originated back in maybe 2007, if I'm not mistaken, but, uh, that actually is the most critically acclaimed television show ever. Um, I have to be honest, I actually haven't watched it, and, and it's, it's not necessarily because I have something against it, um, even though I do know what the show's about based on that definition. And the, the highlights, or maybe I should say the lowlights that I've watched um, of the show really do seem to kind of uh, explore the, the continued descent into depravity, into sin that there is in human life and how one misstep, one moral misstep oftentimes will affect others around you, but then also how that one moral misstep will then make it easier to make another, make another, make another, make another, and then it just multiplies. And because we're relational beings, it again, it affects everybody. And so when people break, they oftentimes break bad. Um, And in a way, the R rating that that television show deserves, it would also be applied to the section of the text that we're going to look at this morning. Have you ever thought that if you were to actually rate the Bible, it would be rated R? Like, let's just be honest. It's rated R. The stuff that you read, honestly, between 2 Samuel 11 and 2 Samuel 19 is rated R. I'll give you some of the lowlights there. So remember last week we looked at the, the sin that David committed with Bathsheba, and then how he killed Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, to cover it up. Well, then, when you get into to chapter 12, God promises David that this sword is never going to depart from David's house, that there's going to be a spiraling of death, destruction, broken relationships, enmity, immorality. All of these things are going to flood into David's house because of this. And that's what we see in chapters 13 to 19. So again, just some lowlights here. One of David's children, actually his firstborn named Amnon, rapes his sister, Tamar. That is followed up by Tamar's brother, Absalom, killing his half-brother, Amnon, for the sin. After that, Absalom, of course, has to flee. He he leaves Jerusalem. And so chapter 13 into chapter 14 explores that reality. And then David finally brings Absalom back from his exile, so to speak. But David doesn't confront Absalom for his sin. He didn't learn his lesson from when Nathan confronted him for his sin. And so Absalom, because he couldn't get the attention of his father, he sets fire to one of David's general's fields. And then Absalom goes into this cycle of wanting to create a coup. He wants to take over, and he begins doing that. He wins the hearts of the people in Jerusalem. So David has to flee for his very life, along with many of his people with him. And David, as he's leaving, he leaves some of his wives, which, by the way, polygamy in the Bible is is not a good thing. If you were ever wondering, I was having a conversation with somebody last week God is not saying polygamy is good. One man, one woman. That's always been God's mentality. You can see that in Jesus' own words when he describes marriage in the Gospels. But David, because it was customary in that time to have concubines, leaves ten of his wives back in Jerusalem with whom Absalom then spreads a tent on the very roof where David walked in his lust over Bathsheba. Absalom spreads a tent and takes David's wives to himself. Talk about breaking bad. My goodness. That's what we find when we come into this text. And yet, throughout all of that, throughout all that you now know, if you don't know about David and his life, now you know. 
But throughout all of that, David is still regarded in the Old Testament as the plumb line for what it means to follow God. He is called the man after God's own heart. Just under ten times throughout First and Second Kings, which follows the story of, of David's descendants who take over the throne, in, in those books of First and Second Kings, it's repeated over and over and over again based on the way that David's children live as to whether or not they walk with the Lord as David their father did. Walk with the Lord. How in the world can David be regarded as a man after God's own heart? How can David be regarded as one who walks with the Lord when all of this happens to David and in his life? And yet, that idea of David still being called a man after God's own heart, I hope gives us a sense of hope. I hope that it gives us a sense of desire. What would it take? Is it possible for all of the stuff that we have all engaged in, whether it's not as bad or whether it's worse than David, is there any hope for us being referred to as men and women after the heart of God? People who know what it is to walk with God. And see, what I really want to do today when we're talking about this idea of of these experiences in David's life and this breaking bad, I want to talk really about how we can maybe redeem that phrase. What is it going to take for God to break us from our bad? Is that even possible? What would God have to do? What would our responses need to be in order for God to rip us out of the badness, the spiral, the multiplication of our sin. Because as bad as David's life gets, we're going to see today God breaks in in goodness. God breaks in. And he shows that even in the consequences of sin, he is working for our salvation. God works to break your bad and my bad. To break us from it. Here's 2 Samuel chapter 5. This is when David is fleeing from Absalom. When David the king came to Bahurim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. And as he came, he cursed continually. And he threw stones at David and all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men who were on his right hand and his left. And Shimei said as he cursed, Get out! Get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, evil is upon you, for you are a man of blood. And then Abishai, the son of Zariah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head. I love the Hebrew there. It actually says, let me go over and lift his head up. I just want to go lift his head up. Would you let me do that, please? But the king said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? If he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, curse David, then who shall say, why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all of his servants, listen, behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look upon the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. So David and his men went on the road while Shimei went along on the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went, and threw stones at him, and flung dust. And the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan. And there he, that is David, refreshed himself. Something happens in this experience for David. Something takes place in these verses. A shift in David's heart. It's like his eyes. Remember we've talked at a number of times in this series about 
how David's eyes, his vision have been upon the Lord, sometimes in moments where God can't be seen. This is another one of those moments. Last week we saw that David's eyes weren't at all on the Lord in his sin with Bathsheba. But David's eyes are refocusing. His heart is recalibrating around the reality of the Lord. What is going on here? What is God doing? We'll get to that. But as God does what he does, what's our response? The first thing is that we need to humbly accept God's discipline. If God is going to break us from our bad, we have to humbly accept his discipline. Shimei, the bad guy in this passage, is cursing David for the deaths in the house of Saul. Now again, if you've been a part of the sermon series or if you know your biblical history, you know that David did not kill Saul or anyone in Saul's house. Shimei is a conspiracy theorist. He assumes that because the dynasty didn't continue with Saul, that somehow David must have had his hand in it. Shimei gets it wrong. Remember, David had two opportunities to kill Saul. One, when Saul was in the cave going to the bathroom, one of the funniest stories in all the Bible. And then the second one, when, when Saul and some of his men were having a little camp out, and David had the opportunity to take his spear and kill him, but David didn't do it. He would not strike the Lord's anointed. Even when... Saul's son, Ishbosheth, took over his reign in Israel. David wouldn't kill him. And when David heard that Ishbosheth had been murdered, David judged the guys who had killed him. David didn't do it. Shimei gets this wrong, and yet there's something that Shimei gets right. David is a man of blood. David has killed Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. David is now reaping what he has sown. Here is a reality that we cannot get around, church. Sin has consequence. And David is experiencing those consequences. And yet, for God's people, if we humbly accept his discipline, God works all of that for our good. And God is at work here. Again, we're going to see more what God is doing and what David is believing about God as we work through the text. But first, let's look as we're looking at David's humble response. We need to contrast that with Abishai. Because God is allowing these consequences to take place. God is allowing Shimei to curse David, even though he's getting part of the story wrong. But Abishai responds in arrogance. All he sees is disrespect. If you go back and you look at the text, Abishai is focused on the fact that David is the king. You're the king. He shouldn't be talking to you that way. This is disrespectful. Let me go over and lift his head up. I've realized, David, in my experience, that if you don't want people talking bad about you, you kill them. They can't talk that way, David. Let me go over and, and deal with this. Shimei is focused on on himself, or he's really focused on David. But think about how this works its way out in our own lives. When we start experiencing discipline or consequence for our sin, oftentimes we think we deserve better. When in reality, we deserve so much worse. Imagine if God were to allow the fullness of your consequence for your sin to come upon you. The fact that God allows what theologians call common grace, that he refrains sin from being as bad as it could actually be, it's a wonder. So when God disciplines us, we need to humbly accept it. David, rather than responding in arrogance, responds in humility. He sees this as discipline. Even when Shimei gets the details wrong, David knows his sin. And you can contrast if you go and you, again, look at this part of the text. Abishai, who wants to cut Shimei's head off. Abishai's focused on the king. You're the king. He shouldn't talk to the king that way. Let the king, let me go and kill him. But David is focused on the Lord. His, again, his eyes, his heart are recalibrating on who God is. Four times in two verses, David says, now the Lord is permitting this. Perhaps the Lord will be good to me. We're going to focus on verse 12 in a minute. But 
David is supposing that Yahweh, God, the Lord, is at work. And David knew, church, that he deserved worse for his sin. He let God's discipline take its course. Now hear this. David is not doubting God's forgiveness. He's not doubting that. But he's leaning into God's refining. But David knows that God, as the proverb says, God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. As David prays in his responsive prayer of his sin with Bathsheba, he prays, Lord, if you wanted sacrifices, I'd bring it. But that's not what you want. The sacrifice of God is a broken, a humble spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, God. You will not despise that. God invites us to humility in light of his discipline. And the reality is that in some sense, almost like when we, when we come to be a Christian, it's as if we begin to have misunderstandings of repentance and grace and discipline. We don't understand exactly how it works. See, humility, repentance, is not a one-time deal. You live there. I love this quote. From Erwin McManus, he says, Every follower of Jesus Christ has at least once walked in humility. I love where he goes with this. He says, You may have recovered quickly, but repentance requires humility. So at least that one time. But then look what he says. He says, We are not going to come to God, not only going to come to God in humility, but to live in it throughout our lives. Humility is most practically expressed in submission. The only thing that I would change there is humility is also expressed in repentance. It's an ongoing reality that we have to engage in. This discipline of God, we never graduate from repentance. It's always our humble posture under the discipline of the Lord. And discipline is the experiencing of consequence for our sin. God allows those things. But listen, discipline is not condemnation. Understand that. And yet we again struggle sometimes with how discipline and grace fit together. If God is so gracious, why is he allowing this in my life? We assume God's grace means a complete 100% all the time get out of jail free card. You do get out of jail free card. It's not as bad as it could be. And yet God disciplines us. See, God disciplines us in grace. Condemnation means the ending of relationship. The complete separation of God from His people. But discipline allows relationship to continue. Parents, you know about that, don't you? You discipline your child because you love them. Strange. The Bible says that, doesn't it? Proverbs 3, we heard it as Sue read this morning from Hebrews chapter 12. Do not, discipline, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of His reproof. The Lord reproves the one He loves. Church, be assured that if God is disciplining you, He loves you. He disciplines those whom He loves. It's not condemnation. It's discipline. And that is response that God ex invites us to is humility, repentance. And I love David's prayer in Psalm 141. I showed part of this verse last week. But think about how this verse in its completeness fits with this text and this experience that David's having with Shimei. Let a righteous man strike me, it's kindness. Let him rebuke me, it's oil for my head. Let my head not refuse discipline. Yet my prayer is continually against their evil deeds. David can approve of what God is doing through Shimei, though he doesn't like the fact that Shimei is doing it. But is that our response? How do we respond to God's discipline, to sin's consequence? Are we more like Abishai or are we like David? Here's a point where we have to be brutally honest with who we are. See, we are much worse than we thought. And our sin deserves much worse 
than we get. And God is more gracious than we could ever imagine. I love this quote from Robert Murray McShane. He says, for every look at self, take ten looks at Christ. And that's exactly what we need to do. That's what David, in essence, is doing, even though he doesn't completely know about Jesus yet. See, David is self-aware in this passage. He's not self-focused. He's self-aware. But he's focused on God. He's looking to God. He humbly accepts God's discipline. But then he confidently hopes in God's character. This is verse 12. The one translation at the beginning of verse 12, let me just read it for you again. It says, perhaps the Lord will repay me with good rather than cursing today. Perhaps. Maybe. It might be. That's not a lack of confidence or faith, but it's an unwillingness of David to presume upon the Lord. God could give David exactly what he's due, but David is hopeful that he won't. Have you ever really thought about a biblical definition of hope? I was working with this this week, and here's how I define it. Hope is the confident expectation of God's future, but not yet received goodness based on past faithfulness. Hope is more than, gosh, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow when it comes to hoping in God. Hoping in God is a confidence. It's a confident expectation of God's future goodness based upon his character, based upon God's past faithfulness. That's what biblical hope is. And David is hoping in the Lord. Now, again, if you don't have your Bible out, I'd encourage you, get it out and keep it out just as we look at verse 12 for a second. David says, perhaps, or it may be, that the Lord will look upon the wrong done to me, that's how the ESV translates that, and that the Lord will repay me good for curse today. But I want to focus in on this idea of the wrong done to David. That is a bad translation. You probably have a footnote, hopefully you have a footnote there that takes you down to the bottom, that actually says, or... My affliction or my iniquity. Three Hebrew words look very similar. The word for iniquity, the word for eyes, and the word for affliction. Really, affliction and eyes are kind of the same thing. Some translators, when they come to this passage... They they basically say that what David is doing is he's, in light of Shimei's cursing, he's saying, gosh, I really hope God looks upon this guy's cursing of me today. My affliction, my tears that are coming down from my eyes because of what he's saying about me. I hope God looks at all of that and he gives me goodness instead. I don't think that's what David says. I think you can read it that way if you're only reading it in the context of just this one story. But David knows his sin. You read this in the light of 2 Samuel 11, all the way to chapter 20, his sin with Bathsheba, his sin against Uriah, all the things that have taken place. I think David is saying, I hope that God looks upon my iniquity and he shows me goodness today. And as a matter of fact, the text also says here, I hope that God looks upon my iniquity and that he will repay me with good for his cursing. Who's cursing? Who did David ascribe the curse to? God. It's not just Shimei's curse. It's the Lord's curse. David realizes what his sin deserves. And yet, contrasting with that, sitting right alongside of that is the character and the nature of God. So see, we not only humble ourselves under the discipline of God, We confidently hope in God's character. And David is doing that. David is daring to believe that God is the one who proclaimed himself to be merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. David was hoping that God would make good on his promise in 2 Samuel 7. I will be to you a father, and he will be to me a son. And when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, 
with the stripes of the Son of Men, but listen, my steadfast love, I will not take away from him. Are you confident in the character of God? I love the way that Dale Davis Commentator on this passage says it. He says, you cannot imagine how deep and warm and longing is God's compassion for you. Even when he disciplines you for your sin. But David would try. He would try to imagine that. Because David knew him. Church, listen, do you know God? Do you know God to be compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love? And yet... The one who disciplines us for our sins. See, David hoped what he knew in shadows and promises, we know in substance and person, don't we? Look at this passage in Galatians 3. Look what Paul says and think about how this squares with all that we've talked about in this section. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it's written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified by God or before God by the law, for the righteous will live by faith. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit. Through faith, church, Jesus is the very revelation of the character of God. What David hoped for, we can be assured of. Gosh, I really hope that God would return goodness to me rather than curse in light of my iniquity. And God says to you in the person and the death And the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I will, I have, I do. That's the gospel. That's the grace of God in the person of Christ. Did you know that David's root here, as he's leaving Jerusalem, is the same root that Jesus himself took during his passion? Think about all the shimmy eyes that Jesus met on the road, cursing him spitting on him, beating him, only to then string him up. Why? So that rather than curse, we might receive God's blessing. But understand, your goal, the other side of understanding this reality of the gospel is not simply to try harder. It's to focus yourself on the character of God. It's my favorite quote by P.T. Forsyth. We are not saved by the love we exercise, but by the love we trust. We are saved not by the love we exercise, but by the love we trust. We're not trusting ourselves to do better, but that Jesus has done it all. And when we look away from ourselves and up to him, that is when our lives begin to transform. Remember how C.S. Lewis put it? He said, Your real new self, which is Christ's and also yours and yours because it is his, will not come as long as you are looking for it. It will come when you're looking for him. Are we looking to the character of Jesus Christ displayed for us in the gospel? Because God's gracious goodness in Jesus is what breaks our bad. We humbly accept his discipline, we confidently hope in his character, and lastly, we faithfully pursue God's renewal. In verse 13, the text simply says, David and all of the people with him went on the road. They continued on the way. Sometimes in life, the consequences of sin continue with you. Shimei keeps hurling rocks and hurling stones. But what does David do? Literally, the text says, David continued on the way. You want to know my favorite psalm? It changes. This is my favorite verse in the psalms. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. 
You know why I love that psalm? Because every single one of us can fit that description. Who does God instruct in his way? Sinners. David is continuing on his way. He's just seeking after God in this. Yes, he's continuing his journey. That's what the text means. I understand that. But David's heart is now recalibrated to following after God. And what happens when David arrives at the Jordan, he's refreshed. Now question, what is the significance of the Jordan River? Why would David be refreshed here? Is it because he can get a drink? Yes. It's also because there's now a river between him and an attacking army that his son could lead after him. David is refreshed. What is the significance of the Jordan River, though, biblically? What do you think was going through David's mind when he got to the other side of the Jordan? This is the place where Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord and God blessed him. This is the place where God stopped the water from flowing so that his people, because of God's faithfulness, could go into the promised land. David was refreshed, not because he was able to simply get a drink. David was refreshed because he was trusting that God would do what only God can do, and that's renew. He realized who God was. He was faithfully pursuing the way. David's journal for this whole experience is Psalm 3. The heading in Psalm 3 says, David wrote this when he was fleeing from his son Absalom. Go home and read it later today. And pay attention to verse 5. It's in red there. I lay down and slept. I awoke again for the Lord sustained me. That word sustain, the word refresh, very similar in the original. It's the Lord who is renewing David. It's the Lord who is sustaining us. I have a friend who sells solar panels for a living. He's trying to get us to put solar panels on our house. Renewable energy, right? I'm all for it, especially if I don't have to pay the electric company every month. What is your renewable energy spiritually? Where does it come from? Look at this quote. A spiritually hygienic, that is, whole person, is one who works from a renewable source of vitality. This is a person who flourishes like a fine sapling rooted in the banks of a dependable stream. She longs for God and the beauty of God, for Christ and Christ's likeness, for the dynamite of the Holy Spirit and spiritual maturity. She longs for spiritual hygiene, that is, wholeness itself, not just as a consolation prize when she cannot be rich or envied instead. Her motives include faith, a quiet confidence in God and in the mercies of God that radiate from the self-giving work of Jesus Christ. She knows that God is good and she feels assured that God is good to her. Her faith secures her against the ceaseless oscillations of pride and despair, familiar to every human being who has ever taken refuge in the cave of their own being and tried there to bury all her insecurities under a mound of achievements. When her faith slips, she retains enough faith to believe that the Spirit of God, whose presence is her renewable resource, will one day secure her faith again. What is your renewable resource? Where do you look for renewal? Are you after spiritual hygiene? Are you humbly repenting before God under His discipline? Are you confidently hoping in his character, that he is who he says he is? Are you faithfully pursuing his renewal, trusting Christ to be all and the Spirit to be enough for you? See, our deepest desire is to break from being bad. And it is nothing but his grace that breaks us from it. Look at this last quote from P.T. Forsyth. Perfection is not sinlessness, but the loyalty of the soul by faith to Christ when all is said and done. The final judgment is not whether we have at every moment stood, but whether having done all that we stand. 
Stand at the end. Stand as a whole. Perfection is wholeness. In our perfection, there is a permanent element of repentance. The final symphony of praise has a deep base of penitence. Listen, it is always a savior, not an ideal that we confess. Repentance belongs to our abiding in Christ and so to any true holiness. So if you want to be a man or a woman after God's own heart, learn repentance. Learn his character. Learn about Christ and the renewing power of his spirit because it's God's grace alone that breaks us from our bad. Lord Jesus, would you do it? Would you do it in us, through us, for us? Take all that we are in all of our failures, in all of our insecurities, in all of our sin, all of our iniquity. God, and would you, by the work of Jesus and the power of your Spirit, make us new. Humble us beneath your discipline. Give us confidence, O oh God, in your hope. Cause us to trust in your great power through your spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us as we pray.
join us for lunch afterwards. If you're sitting in the middle section, can we actually get you to just fold up your chairs and move them to the sides, bring the food tables down the center. Um, it'll be a few more minutes. We'll go grab the pizzas, but stick around. Join us for lunch. And now as God's people receive his blessing. And now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we could ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen.